Good morning, everyone. Welcome to MS Insight webinar. Before I start, I will just run through some of the housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. So if you have to leave the webinar at any time, you can come back to the recording. As you might have noticed, your microphones and webcams are turned off. This is just to avoid any background noise. Uh, you can type any questions throughout the session with the other chat tool, and there will be time at the end to answer any of the questions. You're more than welcome to use our hashtag MS Insights on our Twitter page at MS underscore group. And please, please, please take some time to complete our survey. We really want to hear your feedback and how we can improve our sessions for the future. And what would you like to see in the future from MS Insights? With that, so let's begin. MS Insights webinar. So this is third MS Insights in our series. And this webinar will talk about photogrammetry and augmented reality and how these two technologies can come together to help the industry. These are really exciting technologies and we are, we are keen to share this knowledge with the industry. And hopefully through this webinar, you'll come up, come up with some insights on how to get them started in the field. This webinar is organized in a way that's going to give you a quick uh, basic overview of these technologies, how you can get started, what are the free software available, and maybe come start understanding about how it can be applied to your industry and your business area. With that, let me introduce myself. My name is Awais Monavar. I'm the visualization team lead at AFRC, which is Advanced Forming Research Center, part of MS Centers. I will be joined with my colleagues, Cameron Swanson, who's our R&D engineer for measuring and sensing, sensing technologies, and Xiao Liang, he's our software developer within our team and is working on our visualization technology. The webinar is laid out in four compartments. Um, I will initially talk to you about what, what MS is, National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland. I will give you an overview of visualization technologies. There's a lot of talk about AR and VR, what are they, and, and then give you a bit of a case study where how we see photogrammetry as a new technology linking with augmented reality to make, give you a really powerful business case. With that, and then Cameron Swanson will take over and he will go a bit more deeper into photogrammetry, capturing data using photo, uh, photographs. And then Shah will take that model in and it will give you a really no code uh, example of taking that model and putting that in through a Unity game platform to develop uh, develop a augmented scene. This is just to give you a, a taste of what technologies are available and, and there's a lot more on the field and we, um, we just want to guide you in the right direction. So what is National Manufacturing Institute Scotland? The National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland is a group of industry-led manufacturing research and development facilities where research, industry, and public sector work together to transform skills, productivity, innovation, to attract investment, and make Scotland a global leader in advanced manufacturing. Our goal, and as well, increase productivity by reducing barriers to innovation. We hope it can stimulate investment, increase manufacturing competitiveness, catalyze job creation, strengthen our supply chain links, and inspire and attract talent and equip current and future workforces with the skills and they and the businesses need. We will work with manufacturing businesses of all sizes in multiple sectors uh, and provide benefits across the whole of Scotland. It's a truly a national uh, operation. We are operated by University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, but we are supported by Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highland and Islands Enterprise, HVMC's High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, High Skills Scotland, and Skill Development Scotland, Renfrewshire Council, and Scottish Funding Council. So what is NMS Group looks like? NMS is currently live. We have a building that's going to be completed in 2021 but all the core functions are working right now and you can get, get in touch with us and we're working and we'll be able to support you. It's composed of two specialist centers, AFRC, which is myself and my colleagues are from, and Light Manufacturing Center, which is focused on composite technology. The core elements for NMS will be digital factory, in which our team is working heavily on, 
Manufacturing Skills Academy and Collaboration Hub. So NMS is live. We are more than happy. Welcome to come in touch with us and we can talk you through more about the core elements in our specialist centers. With that, let's talk about AR and VR. Uh, why are we so excited about this technology and why should we be considering this technology in within your business area? AR and VR is a uh, term talked about for a, for a long time, uh, but not right now it's coming fully coming together. The technology advances in technology and adopt, adoption by the consumer market has really propelled this technology forward. And there was a report that came out of a PwC economist and uh, seeing is believing, which predicts this decade will be the decade of immersive technologies. The current market sits at 46.4 billion, but it's expected to reach 1.5 trillion. So that's a huge market that we think every industry, every business should be taking, uh, taking in consideration. If you like to think of it as the, think of it as an iPhone one moment, then iPhone one came out, it was a good technology, but it was really waiting for the right applications to be developed and people to take uh, advantage of the technology to develop new business cases and new user experiences and new customer and new value propositions. And this is where we are at right now. So if you can start considering it for your businesses, there's a huge potential for the future. So where does AR and VR sets and what are they really? AR stands for augmented reality uh, and VR stands for virtual reality. They're both is a, say, special computing and so they understand your physical environment. Augmented reality understands your physical environment and through, your, through your camera phone or through your head-mounted device and then overlay some digital, digital content on top of that. Whereas VR takes completely transforms you into a fully digital environment. You can, you're not able to see the physical reality. It's just a, a fully digital reality. Augmented reality, there's a lot of uh, use cases in, in the market. The first one being the most famous one being is Pokemon Go. So I used your GPS location and overlay some digital content on top of that. But then there's other features like IKEA, which looks at your physical environment, your living room, and then overlay a digital content on top of that. So how does it apply to your how does it apply to your manufacturing industry? So if you look go back to our physical reality, physical reality could be you assembling operations on the shelf floor. You have a new product that comes in that needs a lot of training that needs to be done. You have a new person that comes in, person needs training. Or, you, or maybe there's a complexity of the job. What, how you can, you can rely on augmented reality to take that physical content and overlay it with some digital content. So recently we worked with a, an aerospace company. They work in a maintenance department. And when their asset comes in for maintenance, they're unable to hold that digital content, a physical content in the place to get people trained on that product. We help them with using photogrammetry to quickly take a, Take the take the content, turn that into a digital content, and then visualize that through augmented reality to standard operating work instructions. And recently, NASA's uh, if you looked at NASA's website, they talked about uh, Artemis program and how Lockheed Martin is using AR AR technology heavily to show huge benefits in their production and their schedules. The other one could be if you look at another operations, we could be maintenance side. So you want to have a IoT integration with visualization. So you have a digital twin. You can visualize. Uh, you can visualize your digital content. You can see how the machine is running, and then help that your service engineers to make the right decisions. And then there's a new attracting new customer bases. So right now we talk about IKEA and other big companies deploying, building new products and visualizing them in augmented reality. Could you do that same with your industry? Are you able to showcase your products through your website, through web AR, and customers able to interact with them on their shop floor or they interact with them before they actually purchase it? Or when they have purchased it, are they able to interact with it using photogrammetry and AR together to drive a really, really powerful business case and it helps you engage your customer in a completely different way and how they visualize your, how they see your brand and how they interact with your company. So now looking at uh, the workflow, if, if you think this technology is great, how do we get started? There's four major chunks 
that you need to consider. You have initial model. The model could be your CAD model, or if you don't have a CAD model, if you have legacy components, that could be your photogrammetry model. You will need to optimize it in some way. So most formats are FBX and OBJ, so you need to convert your files into at least those formats. And, and then also optimizing your mesh content. So depending on where the content is, is it on your tablet or a head-mounted device like HoloLens? Then it needs to be optimized. The mesh needs to be optimized to make it a render on your on the remote remote hardware. However, there's some really really interesting technologies coming out now. For example, Azure Remote Rendering, which allows you to render the render your content on the cloud and then visualize it through augmented reality. So you don't need to do optimization at all. This fantastic technology, and that's something potential for the future. And then you will take that content in, you will put that into your augmented reality, and that augmented reality, will, you will develop your augmented reality depending on your scenarios. So if it's an industrial application, like your manufacturing shop floor maintenance, you probably need a, an industrial solution. And there's really a lot of great industrial solutions out there, so we recommend you have a look uh, for them. Or if you're like a hobbyist and you want to learn what they could do and you want to impress your colleagues and your friends you can download a game engine a game engine like unity and then you would import your augmented mo a digital model into the is game engine and then display it on your mobile phone or uh, other devices there's three methods to do it so there's the key methods are the very first and historic one was the image based tracker which we'll show you later which you have an image and you just this computer vision recognizes that image and displays your digital content on top the other one is uh, a bit more advanced. It recognizes your surfaces, so it's recognizing your, your floors, ceilings, tables, and then overlaying the digital content on top of that. The, the next one is, which is a bit more advanced, is uh, object detection. So it's detecting what the object looks like and then overlaying your content on top. So if it's your asset running on the machine, you don't, if that same asset, it, your camera just detects it and this overlays the right content for you. Um, at the right time. And then finally, you need to iterate it. Yes, uh, you're building these technologies, you're building these immersive experiences. You need to make sure you have the end user in mind. What the end user really wants? If it's a shop floor worker, um, get them involved really, and get them involved in, in that process really early on. So when we were working with the aerospace company developing these AR experiences, we got the people working shop floor to actually tell us what kind of a dashboard they like. What, how would they like to visualize it? Don't overload them with don't overload them with CAD data. And when you get and when you develop a prototype, quickly test it with them and then iterate. So that's a really powerful way you can do it. Um, the other way would could be potentially if you're developing a new product, you can you can upload the product on your website. Your customers can visualize the product in their shop floor or in their in their environment, and then send you the feedback of what the product how the product looks. And that could reduce your cost time. So before you even go to into serial production, so before you put in the investment in your manufacturing line, you could be showcasing your product to the customer and seeing what their input is. So let's look at an example scenario uh, where photogrammetry and AR can come together. So let's imagine you have a machine. So the machine has been working on the uh, working with the customer. You're an OEM, and the machine is working fine. Uh, but the customer wants to now change that to some of the aspects of the design because they are running a new product into it, the machine got damaged, or some other issue. So what would happen is the customer would get in touch with your customer support team and your team, and they would say, okay, we would like a certain component of the part to be redesigned for their, for their business, for their end goal. They want, they want to make sure their business is getting improved and they want to improve the outcomes. How would you currently do it? Well, if you are a, a, a basic overview would be, you would take those inputs. If you have a CAD model, you would try to redesign the model. Um, if you don't have a CAD model, then you will need to get dimensions, turn those old drawings into CAD, learn what you had from the customer, and then redesign it, redesign it, and send it back. The customer might want that product, might not, most likely, you would need to send your service engineer to understand the problem on the shop floor or the, in the service, then redesign it, um, and then ship them out. If you're working, if you have a multiple subcontractors developing the sub assembly, 
then it, the problem just escalates. Um, you need to ask uh, the models and drawings from your from your subcontractors. That might take a lot of time. They might not want to share that information, and there might be monetary value involved. And that's just in that same time, your customers waiting. They're getting frustrated. They still expect the same value from you as a as a business. So your your cost is going up, and the customers are not happy. You know, let's reimagine. Let's reimagine what a digital world will look like. In a digital world, potentially you could have how we imagine it to be. You you have a website. Your customer goes through it. You talk to your customer support. They tell them to upload a photogrammetry model. So they take some pictures of their model of the part they want to redesign, and they send you the model. You turn this model into CAD parts. You redesign. And then send that same part through your website or you're through the through another means, and the customer can visualize that same redesign component on their on their part, and they see it. Okay, that's what they were looking for. That's or maybe that's not all you they're looking for, uh, and then give you the feedback. And you're shortlining this, uh, streamlining the process, and then shipping the product exactly the way the customer wants it and the, exactly the way they input it. Your customer uh, is happy because you're streamlining the process. You're saving value because you reduce the overhead, and it's sort of completely new way of developing the customer experience. So last week's webinar, Professor Jill McBride mentioned about new business models. This is this is, could be a new business model. You can offer a customization service for your customers for a subscription fee, and you can tell them if the part needs to be redesigned. Then you can do that. Potentially, another business case could be you take a photogrammetry model after after the product's been in the service for 10 years, and then you can take that as this model, display it on your website, and then use it as a to resell resell that asset in in the near future through augmented reality. So it's a huge business. It's a huge potential for the business. There's a few major uh, steps to to bring this into reality. And I will pass you over to my colleague, Cameron Swanson, who will talk you through photogrammetry. Over to you, Cameron. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thanks, Avis, for the introduction. Uh, it still is morning, isn't it? Yep. Just. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen so you can see what I've got here. Um, so, as I said, my name is Cameron. I work in the metrology team at the Advanced Forming Research Centre. And uh, in short, what I do is I just measure stuff. So, um, usually with fancy equipment. So, picking up from uh, Avesa's example and uh, his slides, uh, I'm going to be covering the sort of first uh, four topics here, primarily the measuring and reverse engineering. So, uh, in terms of measurement, um, you know, in order to get your 3D model. Um, the sort of standard or most basic method would be to use calipers or a ruler. Obviously, this has like fairly strict limitations, um, especially if your part is quite complex, it has extrusions coming off at different angles, then it's going to be near impossible to create a sort of good uh, 3D model. Um, so, the sort of industry accepted methods of uh, measuring a part accurately would be either a CMM, uh, an optical scanner, um, or a handheld scanner. Um, CMMs and sort of optical scanners, such as uh, this one here, which is the Gomatos, um, are sort of the high-end industrial applications, and uh, th these would still obviously be used for a sort of critical component manufacture, and they, they certainly have their place uh, in manufacturing. But right in the middle, um, photogrammetry potentially fits in, where um, it's, uh, it's right in the middle in terms of accuracy, and it's also fairly low cost. So it allows you to sort of generate 3D models fairly quickly. And one of the main benefits of this is that you get rich textures off of it. So particularly for AR, it's very, very useful. One thing with photogrammetry is if you don't do it properly, it, it can be very poor accuracy. So um, I'm going to sort of give you some tips uh, and hopefully you can try this yourself as well. So photogrammetry uh, just means the science of uh, making uh, measurements from photographs. And it does this by um, triangulating groups of pixels between images to generate a 3D point cloud, and um, which then can be turned into a 3D model. Uh, so here's a sort of uh, random selection of examples of some of the work that I've done. Um, on the left here, you've got a whiskey barrel, which was created as part of a digital twinning project with KigTech. 
and uh, this was uh, produced using mobile phone photographs, about 100 photographs in total. Uh, and then this model was then used in the overall sort of 3D model as part of the overall digital twin. And the benefit of this is the photorealistic model makes the content that much more engaging. And then, um, obviously, because I'm working at home at the moment, I'm, I'm fairly restricted in my resources. So this is actually my couch. Uh, and this, again, was just created using mobile phone photographs. Um, and you can imagine, like the example that Avis said, like IKEA, for instance, if, if you wanted to uh, see this couch in your own space in AR, then uh, photogrammetry is like the perfect option to do this. I've created this in a matter of minutes, or the photographs have taken a matter of minutes, and then they were just loaded into the software. Down at the bottom right here, you've got Ross Priory, which is obviously increasing your scale quite massively. This is a building that's just on the banks of Loch Lomond, and this was created using drone photographs. Um, about a 30 minute drone flight in total, and it's it produced a, a very nice looking model. Then at the top right here, this is actually a personal project of mine. I would have uh, built my own window seat using photogrammetry, and you can see the base model here is a, a photogrammetry mesh, and then I've just modeled on top of that. And I'm actually I'm sitting on my window seat right now, and it's 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 still like still still standing, so like it's, it seems to have worked pretty well. Uh, and then down at the bottom here, you you also have a couple of drills which I'll be running through today. Hopefully, if uh, hardware is okay, if our software and everything's okay, um, there's also a link at the bottom here. Um, if you want to see some of these models uh, on your own devices, uh, if you have the app, the SketchUp app, you can actually also view these in AR in your own space. So this gives you an idea of the sort of texture quality you could expect from photogrammetry. As I say, this was uh, taken using mobile phone photographs, and although like a, a couch is maybe not the the most suitable. Um, example, um, you, you can see obviously this applies to many other things. And this is the model of Ross Priory, so hopefully this video doesn't buffer too much of a plate. So this was, uh, as I say, created using a, it was actually like just a consumer sort of level drone, so it was a £1,500 drone. Um, there's companies like Leica Geosystems who are a partner with us, who um, do the sort of professional level equivalent of this. And uh, the reconstructions that you can get from that are, are even better still. Um, and with companies like Leica, they also offer like laser scanning and stuff like that. So you could combine your laser scan data with your photogrammetry data to create a highly realistic and highly accurate model of buildings on this scale. Not, not even just buildings, it could be internals of, uh, of buildings as well. So what's exactly needed for photogrammetry? It's not really a lot at all. Um, in terms of hardware, uh, obviously you need a camera. Um, the choice of cameras is like, you know, it's obviously uh, there's a quite a wide range there. I'll cover that in the next slide. Um, one of the drawbacks to photogrammetry is that it's dimensionless. So scale bars and markers are an imperative here because um, if, if you create a model with, without any dimensions, obviously that's no good if you're looking at reverse engineering. So um, scale bars will uh, bring that scale into your overall reconstruction. The benefit of using markers as well is it, it allows you to get a better registration between images, which will give you sub-pixel accuracies most of the time. Um, lights are an optional thing. It really depends on what your environment's like. If you're in a dark workshop, then lights are probably a good idea. But if you're outside or the light around you is pretty good, then it's probably not too important. But if light, lighting is important because if, if your photographs are noisy or if they're um, pretty dark, then your reconstruction is just going to be rubbish. So in terms of software, obviously your photogrammetry software, um, there's different choices here. I'll cover this in the next slide. Um, there's also mesh modeling and reverse engineering, depending on what your end goal is. The mesh modeling would be the approach if you were wanting to create a model for AR and reverse engineering if you wanted to repair or remanufacture a component. So hardware, um, uh, more specifically cameras, um, vary quite significantly in image quality. Um, like anything, it kind of goes from bad to good. And nearer the bottom end of the scale, um, you've got things like mobile phones. Uh, this is an iPhone, um, which the photos from might look pretty good, but there's a lot of processing obviously behind the scenes there. So the raw photo that comes off of an iPhone is not particularly suitable for creating a good photogrammetry model. But saying that, like you will still be able to create something that will look quite nice. It might just not be that accurate. Then moving up the scale, you've got your sort of compact cameras, bridge cameras, uh, and then right at the end, you've got things like DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, which would be the obvious choice if you wanted to create sort of a, 
highly realistic and accurate model. Software, um, there's a huge selection available. Um, I would typically go for the sort of first row in this column, but it, that's just my sort of personal preference. There's uh, different options available. Um, there's some free softwares available here as well, um, if you're on a tighter budget. Um, in terms of photogram software, meta shape and context capture, I've used both. They're very good. Recap I've also used is good. Um, Meshroom is uh, I've used that before as well. It seems to be pretty good. Um, and obviously it has the benefit of being free. The drawback to these free softwares is that you can't use markers, so it kind of rules out the whole reverse engineering option um, since you're you're never going to get a very accurate reconstruction that way. Then in terms of mesh modeling, um, 3ds Max is kind of like the standard for that, but there is Blender, which is a free alternative, which works pretty well as well. Um, reverse engineering is kind of where it becomes expensive if you're wanting to look at that. Um, typically, if you were reverse engineering, you would be using sort of uh, industry sort of level scanners anyway. But um, Geomagic Design X is a very good option for that. Um, but there are, are also cheaper options such as Extract 3D, which can be plugged, uh, can be uh, used directly in SolidWorks. So what's the actual process behind photogrammetry? Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, you just take photos around an object and an orbit. Um, you can see in the pictures on the right here, um, once you take it around one orbit, you then change your angle, do it again, and repeat. So it's it's quite a sort of robotic process, but it's 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 the sort of the way it works. Like you know, you just try and take as many pictures as you can from different angles. Then just process your images in the photogrammetry software. Uh, that's just sort of eats your images and spits out a 3D model. Um, and then depending on what your end goal is, uh, reverse engineering or mesh modeling. So I'll, I'll run through an example. Uh, hopefully, if, if this software works, it wasn't working this morning. So uh, fingers crossed. Um, so this is uh, just a sort of typical thing that's lying around my flat at the moment because I'm doing a lot of renovation work. Um, so uh, with these, I, I sort of set this up and took pictures around it. Um, and I'll just jump over to the software now. Hopefully, that should work. Okay, so this is the sort of user interface for the photogrammetry software. This one in particular is context capture. Um, as I say, there's different options available, uh, but this one's pretty good. So uh, they've got two sets of photos here. Um, you've got the photos here, which were taken with a mobile phone, and then there's photos here, which were taken with a camera. So this was just really to sort of compare the sort of quality that you get out. So we'll look at this, uh, the photos taken on the camera, just as an example here. So you can see I've just taken photos, different angles here, like all, all over. Uh, but you'll also notice at the the bottom of the image, let's see if we get one here. Uh, I've got these two QR codes which are positioned. Now these QR codes are what I've used to introduce scale into this. And you, by using QR codes, it means that you can automatically bring scale into your reconstruction without having to manually do it. So that, that's obviously like, uh, you know, improve your workflow if you can do that. Um, that you can also do it manually, you know, you can add points and since I've got a ruler here, you know, you could add a point maybe on 21 and then add another point um, on 11 and just set a scale constraint. So you can do that. And then all you do is put a constraint in on scale and then that is a way to scale your reconstruction. But using these QR codes, that will do that automatically. So you've got your photos. Um, but you've not got much else at the moment, so you need to create a 3D model somehow. So the first stage of doing that is you have to determine your positions of your photos. So to do that, you perform a process called aerial triangulation. This is all done in the software. You just literally click a button. It might have to change a couple of wee settings, but there's there's not much involved there. Once you have aerial triangulated, you'll notice that the targets have been identified and all the photographs. And then if we go to the 3D view, We'll see that the camera positions have been calculated. That's these wee dots here. You can see the cameras. And we've got a very rough model of, of our subject here. So obviously this is this is not what we want. We want something a bit nicer than this. So then uh, all we have to do is just reconstruct this to create a 3D mesh. So the reconstruction process again, it's just a simple click of a button, just choose your file format and whatever you want, STL, OBG, FBX. Um, and the 3D model should be here. There you go. 
So we can see the 3D model then that we've got out. And as you can see, one of the main benefits of this is the texture quality you get is fantastic. So particularly for AR, this is this is very good. So as I mentioned, uh, there's there's now two options depending on uh, what your sort of end goal is, what you want to do. So you can either take this into reverse engineering software or you can take it into your mesh modeling software. Um, so reverse engineering software, I'll show you this quickly. Oops, I've been logged out. So I'll just... So uh, this is our reverse engineering software. The software is Geomagic Design X, which, as I say, is a sort of industry standard for reverse engineering. And as you can see, we've got a pretty dense mesh, which is going to make the, the file quite heavy. So if we want to do any sort of design alterations or if we want to uh, repair a part on it, then what we would do is we would just model around this. And as I say, like that, that, this exact same thing works for if you have uh, taken your data from a, a scanner or a CMM. You just it's the output's exactly the same. You have an STL. It will look a bit nicer if it's from a like a GOM scanner, for instance, and it will be more accurate. But for sort of non-critical applications, this works pretty well. So you can see here it's it works quite similar to SolidWorks for those of you who use that. Um, it's fully parametric. So you can see if I hover over these things here, I've got sketches which come up of different areas. I should have said when you when you bring your model into reverse engineering software, what it will do is it will identify different regions. So you can see here, and it will identify these based on the geometry. So if I go to the properties here, you'll see that's been identified as a revolution. We've got that there, which is another revolution, that which is a cylinder. So you can use this geometry to create um, references and your sort of initial coordinate systems and then model around it. Obviously, what I've picked here is not the, the, the best, the best uh, or the easiest thing to reverse engineer, as you, you know, you've got a lot of freeform sort of shapes in here. But it, it still gives a good example of what's possible. Um, so I'll just switch the solid body on now so you can see. Um, so you can imagine if, if you wanted to perform some sort of design alteration or if you wanted to add an attachment to this. For instance, if you wanted to measure between where this screw hole is here and say this one is uh, this one here. If you were to do that with a ruler, it would be pretty much impossible and uh, because you're effectively taking a 3D measurement. So with this, then you have the locations of these holes in 3D space, and you could, I don't know, not that you'd want to, but maybe you'd want to have a handle out here um, on this drill, um, and then you could design something over the top of that. One of the benefits of this software is you can also do a live transfer into SolidWorks, um, which will just uh, bring your model in with the fully parametric features. So then switching over to the AR um, option, so if, if that's what you're interested in, then you would take your model into software such as 3ds Max. Um, 3ds Max is a very good uh, mesh modeling software. Um, I've actually got two drills here. Um, this was another one that I did just around the same time, and uh, so sort I of brought them in here. So if we if we look at the sort of wireframe models here, you can see they are very dense. So obviously that's going to increase the file sizes quite significantly from what we really need for AR. Um, over in the right here, you can see it gives you an idea of the sort of size um, of file that we're going to have because we've got 375,000 faces, which is a bit too much. So what we can do here is we can just cut this down. So say even if we want 20% of that, just click that, enter, and then we can see that the mesh has now been reduced. We need to make sure the textures are kept on. Now if we flip back to this, you'll see that that's not really changed the model at all. And I, I should say as well, this isn't the final render. This is just a sort of a preview of it. Um, as you see, if you wanted to bring this into an AR, AR uh, environment, then it would look a lot better than this. Um, so that's that's pretty much everything from me. Uh, I'll pass you over to Shah, who will now um, sort of implement this into an AR environment and show you how easy that is. Thank you. Thank you, Kemra. Can you hear me? Hi there. Hey, fine. Yep. Um, thank you, Wes and Kemra. Um, my name is Sha, the software developer in AFRC. I didn't start my video because my background is too mess. So following my colleague's explanation, my part mainly focus on the scenario design and visualization. So which means how we can develop and AR application using the CAD model and finish the visualization. Specifically, there are two parts here today. The 
first one is the introduction of the game engine software using for AR development. I will take Unity as an example. As Waze mentioned just now, there are lots of uh, AR software can be chosen, like uh, Unreal, Unity, Vitalis, and so on. Unity is one of the most popular game engine software. It's a free and a contain full of tutorial. It's also a cross-platform software, which means after we build the virtual environment, we could employ our application in iOS, Android, HoloLens, or even website platform. So during this COVID-19 period, the Unity professional version is free to download in three months. So there are more online tutorials free to learn. I will use the Geo model, which the camera demonstrated just now, and show you how can we quickly prototype an AR application based on that. So ideally, we could use the external camera to see the virtual model through the 2D geo image. Secondly, some of our previous projects relating to VR and AR will be shown. So the digital twin visualization project many aims to help the operator to understand the standard operation procedure of the visually refilling system step by step. By scanning the target reference, such as QR code, image, or the physical machine, the virtual content will pop up and provide more immersive and interactive experience for the users. Another example called Future Flow Simulator. So the purpose of this project is to mimic the real movement of the manipulator and the folding process. You can see now here is the interface of the Unity in the left side. We can see the hierarchy window contains a list of game objects. Some of these are directly instance of asset files like the 3D models, which are saved in the bottom. And others are instances of the prefabs, which means the custom game object that make up most of your application. And when you add or remove game objects in the scene, they appear and they disappear from the hierarchy. When you create a group of game objects, the topmost game object is called the parent game object. You can see here. And all game objects grounded underneath it are called child game object. We need to be careful here because when we develop the AR app in Unity, we need to put the cat model at the child game object underneath the target image. After creating the relationship between these two, so once we scan the target image, the tracker, the virtual model will pop up. And I will show you later how to do that. So the inspector view in the left side. The detail plays the detailed information about the currently selected game object, including all attached components and their properties, and allows you to modify the functions of a game object in your scene. So, simply speaking, it contains the game objects like a position, rotation, and the scale values. And if you want to add some of the more code on it, like because Unity can support the C Sharp or JavaScript, you only need to drag and drop the relative scripts directly into the position you want them to appear. So the project window in the bottom displays your library of assets that are available to use in your project. So when you import assets into your project, for example, the geo model or the texture file, you will appear here. After understanding the basic function of Unity, we need to be clarified how we could exactly develop an AR app based upon this game engine. So I outline these three main steps here. At the beginning, the proper AR plugin should be imported in Unity. Today I use a Toolkit as an example. We could check Borfria 
as an AI function library, as um, I always mentioned just now, provide different target types. For example, like recognizable image or models, cloud-based target, local-based tracker, and even the surface target. Now it's uh, free to use for AR and VR development, but uh, if you need to um, purchase, so when you are ready to deploy it. After we import the bot field, we also need to add the AR camera in the hierarchy window in Unity and create the license key and the target image in the inspector window. So we could obtain the free key if you register in the Warfare developer portal and uh, upload your target image in the target manager in the same website. The final step, most important one is to add the CAD model underneath the target image, which means to combine the recognizable picture and the 3D model together. So I'm going to show you step by step how to do that. Here is the latest version of Unity 2019.3. So we need to be careful here about the template. So when you create the new project, if you want to design a 2D game, you choose a 2D template here. But in terms of AR and VR, 3D template needed because most of our virtual content we use are 3D models. Here is the Unity interface, as I explained just now. So the main scene view allows you to visualize and navigate there and edit your scene. And it can also be shown the 3D or 2D perspective you can change. So it's depending on the type of project you are working on. The game view simulates what your final rendering game will look like through the cameras. If you click the play button, the simulation will begin. So now I'm going to show you how can we develop an AR Geo app in Unity. So the first one I mentioned is to import the buffer in Unity. So we just need to click a window, check packing manager, search buffer. And now in the bottom, it should be the install button, but I have already installed the Vault for Toolkit, so you know, no button here. Now we can use the Vault for function. Right click, Vault for Engine, add the AR camera in hierarchy. We need to be careful the AR camera is the external camera linked to my webcam. And we need to delete uh, the. Sorry to interrupt you, just one second. I think a few people are having some issues seeing. A PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Some some seem to be able to see it and some can't. So um, apologies for anyone who who cannot see it. We'll try to rectify this just now. But just to make you aware that there will be a copy of slides and a recording available um, shortly after the webinar. So uh, apologies for that. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen now here? We can see your screen at the moment. Um, yes, we can see it fine. Yes, and see fine. I think maybe it was just a, an issue for some people and not others, but uh, I just wanted to interrupt and just let everyone know if you can't see it for any reason, um, we'll, we will make sure they get copies after. It looks like most people are okay yeah. now. Okay, sorry to interrupt okay. you, Shah. Carry That's on. Fine. That's fine, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the AR camera is the external camera. And now we need to delete the main camera. It's the internal camera. When you develop the, any game application, you need to use that. So we delete the main camera. Here in the AR camera, there are only two things we need to be careful here. So we open the warfare engine configuration and try to add the license. And then once you click add license button, it will jump to the Warfare Engine Developer Portal. So once you make a registration here, you can get the development key 
for free. So it's uh, quite simple. Here, just uh, copy and paste the Python key e in Unity. And the second part is add the database. Again, we jump to the same website. And we will open the target manager at the database. Input your database name and upload your image or 3D model. This is the 2D image I upload for the geo application. Just want to emphasize here, there are three stars here. That means whether your camera can recognize how, what's the quality of this picture. So whether your camera can recognize this picture, you can see the features here. So try to guarantee your upload image at least the three stars. That means the camera will not lose the features. So the virtual content will pop out automatically. And once we finish, Set up the license key and set up the uh, database. We can create the target image, buffer engine image. Now we can see our up upload image has been added in the scene mode. Final step combine the CAD model and the 2D image together. Quite simple drag and draw. Put Underneath, be careful here, underneath the parent game object and create the relationship. Now we can double click the model. It's too big now, we need rescale the size. Now you can see the cat model and the 2D image. Another thing I just want to mention here, we can also rotate the position of the model. If you want to make it more accurate, you just need to type minor 180 here in the inspector view. Another thing I need to mention here is about the texture. Here is the texture by which camera mentioned just now. So what we can do is, again, drag and drop into the model. You can see we can add the color on the model. Now let's have a test whether we can use our external webcam and scan the 2D image and pop up the virtual model. Okay, let me do it properly that I have used the license uh, key before. So let me try to use and find the mistake here. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, let me restart it. I think the problem might be will be linked to the external camera. So the Unity cannot exactly recognize now. It should be take a very long time. So do you have a video that you can show? Yeah, I got a video. So I just I want to have a another try here. And
Uh, would you like us to take some questions while you're doing that? Yeah. 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 Of course. Is that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, so I'll just start with uh, the first one, um, which is to all the speakers. Uh, can Enemus support creating digital twins? Yeah, actually, there's another example about the digital twin demonstration. So I will explain it later. Yes, uh, definitely, uh, Laura. We can. Uh, we are working very closely to create some digital twins. We worked with the uh, Visky cast filling system to create a digital twin. We work in the future how we can link IoT devices and uh, the digital model you know, for bringing the uh, IoT and augmented reality together to create a digital twin. Okay, great. There's a, there's a lot more use cases. Great, thank you for answering that. So the second question we've got is, are photogrammetry methods a low cost alternative to AR slash VR? Um, well, they're, they're not so much an alternative, they're kind of go hand in hand with AR and VR. So it's, it's a, a low cost method to produce assets for AR and VR. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that, Cameron. And the next question, uh, I guess this is to all the speakers, what are the cost savings? Or perhaps it's related to photogrammetry, Cameron. It's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I, is that in reference to your slides? I think maybe yeah. the example. So I, we can talk about our uh, project we recently done with an aerospace company and they have a huge cost. They're bringing a new product in and they have a huge cost of training uh, people in maintaining these new products. Um, and so to, to, to use the current methods of uh, training without using augmented reality or virtual reality, the cost will be significant. So speaking with the chief engineers, they mentioned about the cost is going to be uh, exponential <laughs> that if, we, if they don't change the way they currently train. So the training method, training is like a low hanging fruit for everyone really at the moment. If you can, if you see a training cost, you can digitize your content. People can visualize it anytime, anywhere. Um, you can uh, use that as a, um, as a training module for your customers as well. So the customers can have these, uh, instead of a, having a, a manual, they can have an augmented experience to learn about the product. So there are different ways to look at it. So it needs to be looking at training is the best cost saving or the most uh, easy to see, but there's other applications as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Luis. Um, the next one, I believe, is directed to yourself, Cameron, uh, regarding the drill that you were showing. How long did it take to photograph the drill that you showed us today? Um, so not not very long at all. I think in total, it took about 100 photographs, maybe. Um, and as I say, it's quite a robotic process. So you literally just, you know, have your camera and go around the, the drill like that, take pictures. So it's, uh, I would say, easily less than 10 minutes. Great, great. Well, thanks for letting us know. We'll, we'll take yeah. a pause on the questions. There's a couple more to come, but uh, Shah has yeah. said yeah. that he's ready to to show us his um, presentation just now. Yeah. And sorry, guys. So I just uh, updated the license. Probably the license I use just now is the uh, is white. So once we create the new license, now we can see the camera has been linked. So. Once we scan the 2D image, we can see the models will pop up. And you can share your screen. Yeah. Can you see that now? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, Actually, so if you want to add some more animation on it, it's, uh, you can still add it in Unity, for example. You can also vibrate the, the drill bit. You can also put the tag and indicate you when you, we need to press a button and something like that. Next, I'm going to... Um, All right, thanks. We can 
can take some more questions if you like, Sha. Yeah, I'm trying to find my presentation, so. Yeah, no problem. We'll keep going with the questions just now. Um, the next one was, do you have a dimensional accuracy chart versus imaging technology? Um, it, well, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to do. I've actually created my own sort of dimensional accuracy chart, I suppose. Um, so uh, there's a lot of factors that, that will determine the accuracy. So um, obviously you've got sort of resolution of your camera, you've got the size of the object that you're looking at. So um, it kind of, you can work out what the ground resolution is of your camera. So say your object is one meter across and your camera uh, has 5,000 pixels in the X direction, then um, your accuracy is going to be 0.2 millimeters at best. Um, if you're looking at pixel accuracy, obviously, if you take the sort of professional level systems as like the sort of things that you have from GOM, for instance, they have a tritop system, which is a sort of professional um, photogrammetry system. Um, their accuracies are much better because they, ha they have such a rigorous uh, calibration procedure. And that's what you would really want to use for sort of large scale sort of critical uh, object measurement. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a difficult, difficult question to answer, I suppose, but um, it's it's pretty good in terms of if, if you're just interested in the AR application and for reverse engineering, you know, for the object like the drill, you're probably, you know, you're you're well within a millimeter of accuracy there anyway. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you okay. for that, Cameron. Sha, are you okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah. In this, yeah, so in these slides, I'd like to quickly show you a digital to twin visualization project. So the first part is to visualize the SOP for the operator and let them to understand how we could operate the wish area filling system properly. The virtual model was developed using the 3D Max and the navigation menu and the animation are developed in Unity. So this app used to um, the 2D image at the tracker and deployed in both iPad and HoloLens. So once we scan the 2D image, we can see the manual here. It will indicate you step by step what we need to do next. For example, once we click one of the button, every video will be played and let you know how we can open it. So here, I just want to emphasize in the right side, you can cross and tick. Once you finish one step, the cross will turn to tick and let you know we finished this step, we need to move on to next step. So this part is written in C sharp in Unity. And you can also use some of the internal animator to demonstrate it. Again, a rotated arrow indicate you where the control panel is. And once we click the control panel, I'll show you another video and when we need to where we need to open it and how we can start the machine. Once we finish all the stage A, you can see the uh, outtake now. That means we can move on to the next stage. Here's another animation developed in C-sharp. And tell you how we can open the valve. And let's go clockwise. And another animation here is called how we can install the barrel. Click it, the rotate the barrel. And we have the forklift. Take the barrel, put it in the target place. You can see here, we don't need to scan any 2D image, any tracker here, because I enter the main camera in this app. And finally, and another animation I'm going to show you is created in 3D Max. So let you know how can we fill in the barrel. So in summary, there are three different ways to demonstrate the animation. First of all, you can code, you can use different programming language, and you can also use the third party software like 3D Max and import the whole game object in unity and the third one is 
using in internal animator in Unity. A quick example here is to show you how we can visualize the real-time data. So this app could have both operator and manager to monitor the working status of the refilling machine. So we use the we use the PLC to capture the real-time data from the machine and put them in the cloud and just use the C sharp spray to read and list the data and visualize them with Unity. So this is a VR app and we don't need to scan any image and model and users can see the real-time data through the HoloLens and iPad. Two buttons here, real-time live data and real-time demo data. So once we click the um, real-time, you can see all the data offline because currently the machine is not working. So when we try to the demo one, we can see the speed of the liquid, the level of the barrel, uh, the level of the tank, and the pressure of the valve. And the final example is to instruct the operator to understand the manipulator's movement, the big future fork manipulator in the left side. And we try to avoid the mistake, for example, when the operator controls the real man manipulator using the joystick. So we mimic the real scenario. And the real scenario has been simulated in Unity 3D. Here you can see we are in the control room, there are three different cameras here. And we can use our joystick to move the manipulator, go forward and backward, rotate it, the manipulator in that particular angle, and press the joystick button and try to capture the cylinder. If we want to see it more clearly, you can just uh, click the gripper camera and it will jump to the gripper and see whether we capture the cylinder in the proper position. And then we press the backward button, rotate it, the manipulator, control the manipulator, put them in the press and see forging process. So finally, I just uh, summarize some of the useful tutorial for AR software development in Unity. So the first tutorial will teach you how we could develop an AR app in six minutes. You could use your mobile phone to scan a $2 note and uh, the virtual Donald Trump will pop up. <laughs> If you want to learn more about the functionality of Unity, you could uh, go to learn.unity.com to find more information. It will give you more detailed explanation. So, and um, thank you for listening today. Now I'm going to pass the host to my colleague Wes, and he will give you a summary of today's session, uh, today's webinar. Thank you, Shah. Um, as you've seen, there's a lot of benefits out for the manufacturing industry. We mentioned about training, de-risk and investment, and potential of attracting the right talent. And if you're looking at in this field and you want to develop new business ideas, this is a huge way of looking at new value proposition for customers. And with that, uh, we would like to finish our webinar. We are happy to answer any questions. We have gone over a bit over, uh, over time, but we are happy to take any questions right now, or if you would like to email them to us. Thank you, and uh, happy for any questions. Thank you for that, Wes. Yes, we do still have quite a lot of questions here. I um, appreciate we've, we've passed uh, the half past mark, but um, I will ensure that all these questions are recorded. Um, if you have to leave for any reason, but we'll keep going and keep answering your questions until we reach the end. Okay, so Sounds the good. next question uh, that we've got is, what types of tools or SDKs would you recommend for AR development? 
actually there are different different options probably so as you mentioned the uh, like uh, AR core AR kit and uh, warfare weak tilt but it's a also depends. So um, which one is they? Uh, um, for example, some of them could be used to scan the two D image. Some of them could be used to uh, scan the three D model. And uh, there are different options so you can choose. And if I can just add on top of that, it really depends on your end use case. So if it's a, if it's an industrial use case, if you're looking for the manufacturing environment, then we really recommend you go out and look for the industrial solution so you can integrate without any coding into your manufacturing workflow. If you're looking at uh, developing for the consumer market or developing a new digital transformation strategy in, into your company, then there's other ways to look at it. So you can look at what uh, uh, ARKit, ARCore, and other tech software its libraries are available that are doing a lot of complex things in the background uh, for your end use case. So again, it really depends on your use case. That's great. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Um, the next one is, what determines the image quality star rating when augmented imagery in Unity from Vuforia, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrongly, industrial AR software? So yes, so um, yeah, because I actually uh, camera mentioned about the quality of the image. So if you can, uh, so most of the two D image can be recognized. So if you can put a more color on it, so that means more features could be captured. So um, I think for me, it depends. Uh, uh, for example. Uh, the quality of your hardware, like what kind sort of camera you use to take the picture, something like that. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you for that, Sha. Um, the next question is, um, what kind of processing power is required to run the software that we've seen today, both from a development of images slash meshes perspective and a displaying purpose, e.g. on the shop floor? I suppose, first of all, from the photogrammetry point of view, um, it is quite a RAM intensive process um, and it helps if you have a good graphics card as well. Um, so you typically want, want to have probably at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. The thing with that is, though, that nowadays there's, there's various options for cloud computing with a lot of these softwares. So it doesn't really matter what computer you're running on. Uh, you can you can process a lot of this stuff in the cloud and just kind of leave it and then come back and it'll be ready for you. Um, so it's as if if you're if you're not going down the cloud processing route, you you probably do need something that's it's fairly high spec. But um, I mean the laptop I'm running off of is a uh, 16 gig RAM and it's a uh, GTX uh, 920 or something. I can't remember what it is, but it's it's not anything super high end. So it. Obviously, the, the the more RAM, the better graphics card, the better. But yeah, that's at least from the photogrammetry perspective. I don't know about um, the AR side of things. In AR space. Yes, uh, for AR development, it's something similar. You probably need some sort of a high graphics card. It, like you mentioned, it's, it could just be a normal uh, lower end of GTX NVIDIA graphics card. Um, you're doing... Um, you bring in these high competitions models. So if you bring in a really complex model like uh, Future Forge into your environment and you're manipulating it, it, it does require the same sort of uh, same sort of laptop or desktop environment. And in terms of deploying that on the shop floor, you will need to have a look at uh, tablets or Hololens to deploy that application. But most mobile phones are able to do deploy them as well. And there's a question on on the chat about. Uh, how many content uh, from Harris, or how much content you can add into your visualization environment. You uh, like I was mentioning, you shouldn't add too much content on the visualization because you don't want to overload uh, the end user with too much data on the screen. But you also want to manage your competitions, competition on your hardware. So if you're using a iPad or a, or a HoloLens, you, you, you don't want to add too many models because it's adding too much competition on a mobile hardware. Um, so. You can add a lot of content, but you need to manage that. Yeah, manage that. Well. Great. 
Thank you for that. I don't know if this relates to the next question then. Do you need to see hash experience to build this capability? Absolutely. Yes, no. absolutely. No. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, as I say, introduce us now. Uh, for example, some of the animation, even very complex animation you want to create, you can use the um, internal, it's called a, a, an internal add on, it's called an animator in Unity. So uh, C sharp is uh, just an um, alternative way and try to move the, for example, move the manipulator very accurate. Probably you need to write some of the script on it. Great. Uh, two more questions then. Thanks everybody for sticking with us. Um, the, is there a limit to how complex or detailed, etc., uh, or how many individual components can be inputted into the visualizations? Yes, Laura. So that's the question I was trying to answer. Uh, right? the, uh, it depends on uh, on what hardware you're running on, but on your on your laptop, you can bring in as many content as you possible can. I'll maybe just add to that as well. Like the so with uh, as mentioned the things like Azure remote rendering coming about, um, that's very likely to be the solution to sort of hardware limitations in the future. Um, it's kind of early days yet, but what we'll likely see is all of the sort of processing done in the cloud, and then all of you'll see on your your AR device or your 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 computer screen will just be effectively a stream from um, the the computer that's uh, processing. Um, and also th there's other with with modeling um, photogrammetry models and um, there's a uh, level of detail models that can be generated automatically and with these what it does is it loads the model to the, to the area that you're looking at so if you've got a massive uh, you know model the size of a city it will only load the area that your screen is looking at rather than loading the entire model so it's a, a bit and the, it's the way that sort of computer games work um, so they can load massive scenes in uh, and that's that's something that's very beneficial for AR as well Okay, great. Um, well, we're on to the final question then, guys. Um, can the visualizations mimic various gases slash fluids, et cetera? Yes. Um, as, uh, I, I watched the uh, video before and uh, you, um, you can uh, mimic, for example, the, the flow, um, the flow of the liquid, um, for example, uh, we talk about uh, uh, one water wheel company and uh, potentially try to develop some of the AR uh, application to help them to the mimic this uh, virtual scenario. So it's definitely possible. That's brilliant. Um, any more comments from the speakers at all? That's all the questions we have for the session. Um, but yeah, so just want to thank everybody for joining us today um, and, and staying with us to the, the bitter end. Um, and a recording will be available. There will be a survey to follow as well. So we'd really appreciate your feedback on this. Um, and we look forward to welcome you, welcoming you to the next Enemis Insights Online. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you again to our speakers. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Sha. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone.